for the very first volume of the New Thinking Aloud Dialogue series, Is There Life After Death? Publication date is June 1st. Thinking Aloud Conversations on the Leading Edge of Knowledge and Discovery with Psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Our topic today is ethical considerations in the psychic realm. My guest is Mark Bocuzzi, who works at the cutting edge of applied parapsychology, technology, and interactive media. His goal is to normalize, optimize, and utilize psi experiences and abilities to create a more compassionate, sustainable, and interconnected world. He is co-founder with his wife, Julie Beischel, of the Windbridge Institute, dedicated to studying the non-local nature of consciousness. He is author of Beyond the Physical, Ethical Considerations for Applied Psychic and Afterlife Science. Mark is based in Tucson, Arizona, and now I'll switch over to the internet video. Welcome, Mark. It's a pleasure to be with you again. Hi, Jeffrey. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me on. I'm very interested in this discussion. It's one that's been on my mind ever since I you know, began studying parapsychology seriously half a century ago, the ethical considerations. And I remember in, in the early years of parapsychology, or for me, my early years, there was a, a French psychic who was doing metal bending experiments. His name was uh, Jean-Paul Girard, and he was uh, involved in research at the Henri Poincaré Institute in Paris, major scientific research center with a physicist, William Wolkowski. And he was experimenting to see if you can use psychokinesis to change the genetic makeup of fruit flies. Uh, a very elegant experiment. We know a lot about uh, fruit flies and, the, and their genetics. And when he discovered that the data was coming through highly successful, that through the concentration of the mind, the genetic makeup of these fruit flies was being altered, he shut the experiment down. He said, we are not ready for this yet. I don't want to go any further. And And to me, that was the right thing to do. I wonder if you have any comments about that particular instance. And I would agree at that time. And I think we're, we're, we're facing similar questions today. Uh, not just because of things that Psy can do, but, you know, even just, you know, the way technologies worked with gene editing and things like that. I know for my own research, I spend a lot of time these days. You know, when I first started, I've, I've only, I've only been in this field for about 20 years. Um, and uh, when I first started, I was all gung ho. I was like, what can we throw Psy at? What can we make it do? How do we make it work? So um, I did a lot of different experiments on all kinds of different things. And it's just been in the last few years when I've really started to realize that, um, you know, through my own process and for better or for worse, that, um, you know, maybe I shouldn't talk about some of these things that we've discovered. Maybe there's a better way to roll this information out. Maybe I'm not the one that needs to put this information into the world just yet. So I've spent a lot of time over the last maybe four years really thinking about that. And um, I've cut back on the number of publications I, I do. I've, I've cut back on the number of presentations I give because I've become really concerned about um, what does it mean to have psi abilities and to apply psi abilities. Because for me, I've moved beyond just basic research. Uh, from my perspective, psi is, uh, is real and something that people can utilize on a regular basis. And also, I'll go out on a limb and say I support the survival hypothesis at this point. Um, 
So there are many implications for integrating what we've learned from survival research into society. And, um, uh, and I think that's what this, this book sort of does is it projects a little bit into a future where this, where psi and survival have been accepted by the mainstream and at least mainstream research. And, um, so the guardrails are kind of off and the stigma has been removed. So, what does that mean for corporate America? What does that mean for an industrialized uh, nation or society uh, where we're driven by a market economy and capitalism? Um, and so that's sort of the some of the questions that I tried to ask in this book through a series of uh, uh, scenarios and, and other uh, uh, questions and essays. So, yeah, it's really interesting. I, 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 I'm I'm excited to hear that this is something you've been thinking about as well. I know other people have, like I know Stefan Schwartz, for example, has written on this topic in a number of different ways. But I think that was one of the things that drew me to, to writing this book was that as a field, we haven't really like in other fields of science, um, there are there are whole parts of those fields that are dedicated to the ethics of the research and how those how those the uh, the implications of those of their research on society in general, and I haven't seen any sort of um, uh, cross uh, field effort within parapsychology or other ed sciences to really look at that systematically. So I thought um, maybe it's time to at least uh, throw something out into the world to see how people react to it, and if I could stimulate a conversation around these topics. Well, I think you've written an important book. You've got a number of examples you've asked people to consider. You've also looked at, I don't know, half a dozen or so different paradigms of how we view ethics in the modern world. But it did strike me that there was one important gap in, in your book, which I think has to be addressed if we're going to look at the ethics of Psy. And that is we have to go back a few hundred years to the time when witches were being uh, burned at the stake and tortured and punished because people believed that they had uh, psychic abilities that were being used in a harmful way against their their neighbors. And I don't think our culture has really fully digested the experience of witchcraft uh, yet. And in fact, I know in some countries, uh, witches are still being persecuted. You're absolutely correct. And it's a, it's a, it's a serious issue. It's a serious topic. And I purposely avoided it in this book because I really wanted to focus on sort of the here and now, but this whole cross-cultural conversation, because there are other cultures outside the United States where I'll say the word supernatural for a lack of a lack of a better term, uh, are the supernatural are are already integrated into daily life in various ways, right? So they don't struggle with this dichotomy the way Western culture does. Um, so there's a lot to be learned from that as well. Uh, but I do the. I sort of hinted in the book that protections need to be made for the psychics and the mediums and the practitioners and the healers. Like, so when we start thinking about, you know, how do we integrate these things into society going forward? Not only do we need to think about, oh, consumer protections and, you know, the right way and wrong way to do psychic ability, but we also need to protect the people from persecution and exploitation, uh, that are, that are performing these services that, that are using these skills. So I didn't go full on, like, we need to look at the historical context, but I did try to drag some of those lessons into a modern, context. Well, the Winbridge Institute, uh, which is where you've done your research for the last 20 years or so, has focused primarily on working with mediums and, and uh, often in, in the context of providing solace and maybe some information for bereaving uh, family members. Uh, what are some of the ethical issues that you've encountered around that? Well, I think some of the, the things that the that I talk about in the book or just in general is um, uh, key thing is that people need to understand 
uh, what a mediumship reading is, for example, what it's not, what kinds of information can be expected. There's a lot of uh, misconceptions in the media about what uh, a sitter should expect. And um, so we've spent a lot of time trying to educate people about uh, how to get the best uh, um, uh, uh the best outcomes from a mediumship reading. Should they do a mediumship? They need to do some soul searching themselves to determine whether or not a mediumship reading is the best thing for them. For example, the integration of their experiences with licensed healthcare providers. So all of these things, uh, also, you know, trying to work with, uh, with mediums to be, you know, to explain like you need to be transparent about, your practices, right? What is, what are your services that you're offering? How are you offering? What can people expect from you? What are your business practices? Do you have a refund policy or not? And if you do, what is or isn't? Or what are your other like scheduling or other things that, so all the normal business practices that someone would expect if they were going to hire a professional, but also with um, a little bit extra TLC because chances are the, the majority of the people seeking out mediumship readings, at least from our experience, are grieving and maybe suffering in some way, shape, or form. So, so there needs to be careful consideration on both sides, right? The sitters need to be prepared and informed about what it, what intervention, what this, what this intervention is going to do for them. And the mediums also need to be uh, sympathetic and understanding that they may be dealing with populations that uh, may be vulnerable. So there's uh, some trade-offs there. I would think that uh, one of the vulnerabilities, and it's a very ironic one, uh, you made a point of stating earlier that, that you accept the evidence for survival, as do I, but I'm aware of uh, some ethical review boards that have questioned parapsychology research as, as being unethical because should a research subject uh, have a good experience, they might come away believing that psi is ontologically real. And, and for some of these ethical review boards, that would be a, um, an ethical defect. I, I, that's really interesting. We haven't encountered that. Um, you know, the thing that we encounter most is um, risk benefit, right? So we're going to be like, oh, we're going to get these people and we're going to have them relive their, their experiences of their lost loved one, right? And so then the question is, well, what's your research going to show? And are we going to push the research? Are we going to push our knowledge of this phenomena to a point where it, it, it offsets any, uh, you know, sort of, um, distress that the participants may be going through? And then how are you going to support those participants should they experience, uh, undue distress? Right. So that's the sort of the cost benefit is, uh, Real risks versus benefit. That's cost. That's wrong. But, um, is analysis is where we often get hung up, which actually holds us back on a lot of research. We, uh, early on, we had a genetics program that we were going to look at, right? Cause there's a lot of talk about how mediumship, for example, runs in families, right? So that is a, is a perfect sort of population to start thinking about. Well, is there a genetic component to side? And at the time, this was, maybe five or six years ago, um, you know, genetic testing was becoming more popular. It was becoming more accessible. But the IRB we were working with was like, you know what? There's still too many questions about how those data are going to be used. Even if you de-identify the data, how are the services that you're using going to protect these people's identities? And where are those data going to end up? And how might this hurt people in the future in terms of their health care or their employment or it was really a new area and so they declined our request to do that research and um, so we haven't pursued it other people have since taken it up and the technology's gotten better and the protections have gotten better and that's fine but um, but that's a, that's an example of where I think we were pushing pushing the curve a little too much too fast. And in RRB, it was like, mm, Psy is pretty speculative and survival is pretty speculative and maybe the risks aren't worth the, the, the benefits, the, the amount of knowledge we're going to get from this right now. And uh, I've sort of embraced that. I'm okay with going slow. 
on a lot of these topics. I, uh, I, I don't, um, for example, I came out um, publicly uh, a couple of years ago about a potential moratorium on animal side research um, because we're still grappling with things like the source of side problem, right? So how much more research are we going to do to animals? How many more animals are we going to shock and scare and confine and, you know, just so we can come up with data that we can't separate the source of the, of the phenomena of the, of the, of the um, results. Right. So I'm like, well, maybe we need to hold off on that kind of research until we get a better sense of how psi works. Well, you may hold back in terms of what you do in your uh, research laboratory, but out in the world at large, you have thousands of uh, psi practitioners, pretty much completely unregulated. I don't know that there exists much in the way of a certification program for any of them. I know your organization has certified some mediums, and, and another organization certifies some mediums, but you give, for example, uh, among the many examples, you talk about psychic weather control. This is an area in, in which I do have some background. I did a 10-year field study with a man who, who did numerous uh, demonstrations of psychic weather control, and, and you raise uh, questions that, of course, um, are completely... Yeah, Unregulated at this time in in our culture uh, concerning the the side effects of such research. Yeah, right. So what are the what are the implications if you control the weather in one area? What happens to an area downstream, right? And and who gets affected? And does you know does the does the rich affluent neighborhood that can afford to hire a bunch of psychics divert the the, the storm away to a less affluent area. Now those people are left to sort of pick up the pieces, right? So um, disparity, access, um, uh, class structure, all that stuff uh, becomes an issue. And then in terms of just general regulation, the, the question becomes, what do you regulate, right? So for example, there are so many factors that impact uh, a, a psychic or an intuitive or a medium's ability to do what they've been asked to do, whether it's the specific type of tasking or the um, uh, their own ability or the the relationship they have with the people that have hired them or how their um, performance is judged, right? Uh, the the ranking and scoring, and even if you're in the in the case of mediums, for example. We assume the, the our, our process is, assumes the existence of a discarnate, a third party, other than the medium and the, the sitter, and who knows what that person's doing, right? There's, the medium has no control over what the discarnate's doing. So, what do you regulate? So, I often think about like like um, uh, uh, mediums and psychics as sort of like artists, right? And so. You know, what do you regulate with an artist, right? So I can, I can hire an artist and they can do a beautiful painting for me. And you say, Mark, I love that painting. How do I, I'm like, this is the artist. And you talk to the artist and they do a painting for you and you hate it, right? Whose fault is that? Is it the artist's fault? Is it my fault because I gave you someone you didn't like? Is it your fault because you didn't convey what you wanted to the artist or truly understand their work again, like, again, I'm not trying to place blame here, but the point is, is that it's really, it's not like a lawyer where you can go, this is a solid body of knowledge that you need to be responsible for learning and mastering and applying. And that doesn't work in the psychic realm. But what we can talk about are the practices that um, dictate the use of those skills so, you know, do we use uh, psychic ability to change the weather? As a society, do we think that's a good idea? Who needs to be informed when that's going to happen? Whose permission do we need to get? Who, like, you know, what protections are there for the psychic? What prote and so on. So it's more to me about operations and informed consent and transparency than it is about, oh, you're a medium and you only scored 80%, so you can't pass our certification because, but, you know, we only 
past people that do 90% or those kinds of like skill based certifications and regulations versus like, you know, here's how we're going to use this in society and here's how we've decided to use this and here are the rules governing the application of those things. Does that make sense? Well, for the most part, the uh, activity of professional psychics is done on a uh, individual basis, usually not on a corporate basis. There are a few exceptions, uh, like the government's 20-year program uh, using remote viewing uh, for espionage purposes and uh, military intelligence and the like. But uh, it, it's quite rare for the most part, I think, these days, and of course, I don't have complete information, but my sense is that in corporations and in government, there are individuals who are curious and who seek out the services of psychics, and they do it typically on their own time and out of their own pocket, and the organization is not formally in, involved. And that, that seems to be a way that organizations can escape both the controversy and the responsibility for having anything to do with uh, psychic functioning. Yeah, that's exactly right. Um, you know, like I, I think about Stargate, like, you know, in, in the U.S. now, for example, we have these um, incredible surveillance, technologically based surveillance programs that we can get information on basically any U U.S. citizen, any citizen around the world but they're still tightly regulated. It's not a perfect system, right? But there's still a review of like courts and a FISA court and a thing and a pro like, like people have to make a case. I'm not sure that happened with Stargate. Like, I don't know what the regulation, <laughs> the regulatory oversight was, um, or even, you know, and again, it was a black project and all those kinds of things. So those people generally don't, but, but if they were to do something or if governments or, or, um, industry were to do something similar, what would those regulations look like? What would that oversight look like? And who would create those oversight um, organizations? And then who would be responsible for maintaining them? And, and so even this idea of regulation comes with its own set of uh, questions and ethical concerns about how they're implemented and who's in charge of them and, uh, you know, follow the money and all those kinds of things. And, and in the most extreme cases, you have scenarios such as the movie, The Men Who Stare at Goats, where, where the idea is that you could kill a, a human being or an animal through uh, psycho. Kinesis. And in anthropology, it's called death by hexing. And uh, anthropologists have come up with actual examples that appear to be uh, people who were had a hex put on them, a pointing of the bones ritual, for example. Um, the individuals might have been in another country, so they didn't know that they had been hexed in this fashion, and yet they die mysteriously. So, uh, it, d it does suggest that the potential for uh, psychics to do harm is is quite real. I think so. And even in more subtle ways. But I think um, like, you know, for example, there's a phenomenon known as remote helping. Right. So this is where you get a psychic and you have a person that's doing a task and that the psychic uses a combination telepathy or PK. Um to help the person stay focused or perform a task in a certain way, right? Well, ultimately, if you're in collaboration with the psychic, that's fine, but otherwise that's mind control, right? Mm -hmm. And that raises all kinds of questions, especially like, like now if I'm going into a voting booth and I'm being remote helped by someone that may or may not hold my political views, what does that mean? for autonomy and our democratic process. Uh, and that's some of the things that the book sort of looks at. Like it looks at these various scenarios, but it also, like I said, it projects into a future a little bit. Like, like you were saying, well, you know, the government is sort of does things on the sly and corporations don't really go, you know, make their stuff public. But if at some point these non-local phenomena, these extended human capabilities are accepted and integrated into the mainstream, which is which is something that our field is trying to do. There, there's an active group of people that are that are working to normalize and and integrate these phenomena, so that our scientific worldview is 
uh, is more encompassing. And if that happens, that removes all the stigma from that, that may be holding these companies and, and corporations back. And now the guardrails are gone and now it's just profit motive or something else. Like, you know, um, and so that's what the book sort of speculates into. Um, it, it looks into this sort of, uh, I call it a hypothesized future. Well, I do think we're edging very slowly into uh, the kind of future you envision. At the same time, I think the issues uh, that need to be resolved are incredibly deep. And, and I get the impression the human race, human civilization as a whole is not prepared. A uh, good example would be the, to distinguish between people who are, let us say, victims of psychic attack on the one hand and people who are suffering from paranoid delusions. On, on the other hand, I hear from people all the time who believe that the, the government is using electronic technology to project thoughts into their own brains. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, this idea of psychic attack is a real issue. Uh, I'm doing a, a project that deals with climate change. And, um, uh, you know, just in regular climate science, climate scientists are often attacked, docked, you know, on the internet, they're, they're threatened. Now, imagine if those people got word that we're using psychic abilities on top of this climate science, uh, like, People may really go nuts. I did an interview recently where I talked about mostly about mediumship and survival. And while uh, comments were posted, the, the, the video ended up online and there were comments that were posted. And I was immediately surprised with how many people said what he's doing is against the Bible. Deuteronomy and, you know, cited the, the Bible verse where, you know, you shall not talk to dead people and whatever. I don't, I don't know the exact quote and I don't want to be disrespectful uh, to the people that, that embrace, uh, embrace that ideology or that, that philosophy. But um, a lot of people are like, he's, they're just demons. He's fooling himself. He's right. He's, he's, he's affronting the word of God. And regardless of what science has to say about these topics, eventually we're still going to be dealing with a lot of these various cultural aspects as well. Right. Just because science says it's true, whether it's climate change or vaccines or or whatever. Right. People are going to say, no, the earth is still flat or the the, the vaccines or wh whatever. There's always going to be an opposition to the position of science. Um, the 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 thing about psychic attack, which um, which really uh, was driven home for us a couple of years ago, uh, we uh, we work with a medium and uh uh he's he's based in phoenix and um and uh, uh he's he was married and he has a him and his husband had a uh um a metaphysical bookstore and one evening uh, a customer came in and all this is in the public record you can find all this um one evening a customer came into the store is very agitated and accused them of psychically attacking him and so they had to get the guy out of the store and they eventually got everything calmed down and the rest of the rest of the day and they started to close the store. And so, uh, our, our medium that we work with, his husband was like, I'm going to go, goes out the back door. Well, apparently the, the customer went, bought a gun, came back and killed our friend's husband or our associate's husband, uh, right there in the, in the back of their store in the parking lot. And then came around to the front, and fortunately, uh, the person, the medium we work with, was secure, and was able to call the police. And the police came, and the person was actually uh, was eventually apprehended. But but this happens, right? You talked about persecution of witches and things like that. Well, people are you know, it doesn't happen every day, but it it, it happens enough, and it happens pretty close to home for some of us that work in this field, and it's. Uh, it's 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 heartbreaking and terrifying. 
the very notion of psychic functioning uh, generates paranoia in in some people, even in perfectly sane people. I give you a, an example: Arthur C. Clarke, the great science fiction writer, who has written about parapsychology, both in uh, a positive sense in some of his novels and a negative sense in some of his editorials. Uh, about it. And I had an occasion once to ask him uh, whether did he or did he not believe in ESP? And his answer was very telling. He said, no, I do not believe in ESP because I don't want anybody to read my mind. Yeah. So, so that's one of the things that, again, I talk about in the book is this idea of, of where do the lines of autonomy get drawn? And you know, would this really require a fundamental shift on how we think about human existence or life or existence in general? Privacy, for example. Yeah, yeah, right. So, um, I mean, are all these things ultimately just illusions? And at some point, do we have to give up these trappings that made us feel special or allowed us to keep our current power structures or whatever. Like, I'm not saying uh, the other thing too, I just want to stress about this book is that it goes into a lot of different areas. And this is not a recipe book. It is not a protocol book. It's a book that asks questions. And I don't necessarily agree. And it, and it tries to provide some insight into those questions through various perspectives. And I don't necessarily agree with all those perspectives, but I thought it was important to include a wide range of them um, so that people could have this conversation. So I don't want people to pick up this book and go, oh, what does page 28 say about using a medium in palliative care, right? Oh, this is what we should do. No, that's not what this is about. This is about trying to stimulate a broader conversation. So I'm really excited that we're, we're having this talk. Well, one of the things that you point out is that even amongst ethicists, people who spend their whole life studying ethics and, and endeavoring to practice ethical principles, there are lots of disagreements about what is ethical. Yeah, absolutely. There are, there are multiple perspectives, right? There's, uh, there's perspectives that say, well, you know, um, the autonomy of a small group of people might, it may be okay to, um, sacrifice that if it uh, causes great benefit to the to the larger population. And there are others, uh, philosophical views, that are the exact opposite. Uh, an injustice one to done, done to one is an injustice done to all. So we, under no circumstances, is it okay to do this thing or that thing to one person, a hundred person, a people, or 10,000 people? Um, so, yeah, these are really interesting to me. These are really interesting questions. And it's something I've always been interested in this intersection of science and society and technology. And, you know, sci is just another technology to a certain extent. Um, and what does it really mean if we decide to treat it like a commodity, right? Instead of, you know, there's, I talk a little bit about this in the afterward of the book. I don't know if I'm jumping ahead, but it's, uh, um, one of the things about Psy to me that I think is amazing isn't it's, isn't in its ability to control or predict. It's, um, it's more to do with its ability to connect, right? So, um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell a little bit of a weird story, but bear with me. Uh, when I was younger, I used to, I used to be outside all the time and I love being in nature. So when I was going to go to college, I thought, well, maybe I'll go into forestry because this will give me an opportunity to, to, to do those things. So I, uh, my freshman year, I enrolled in a, in a school in a, a SUNY school and I, um, I, I studied forestry and I quickly realized that it exact, it was exactly not what I wanted to do. Um, because when I go into a forest at the time, and even now, I feel that the forest in and of itself has value. It is a, an important part of the ecosystem. It is a, a place for healing and connection where people can feel, uh, can rejuvenate. And so the, the forest has value. It's important. But from the forestry perspective, the forest is nice, but it only really has value once it's harvested and cut down and turned into raw materials. Right. That's when the forest has value. And I'm worried that when we talk about 
Psi applications that were thinking about the value of Psi as the trees and not as the forest, right? The simple fact that that these that phenomena exist, that we have these experiences, speaks to so much more of the rich existence that human be- beings have than we've been allowed to think about through this mechanistic, reductionist, uh, materialistic worldview that's been evolving since, you know, uh, the start of the scientific revolution. So that to me is one of the really, and again, I don't want to be like a Luddite, right? I'm like, we should never use Psy to solve problems. No, but if we're going to do it, let's do it in a, in a responsible way, in a way that, that makes sense, that's compassionate, that, um, but also don't lose sight of this bigger picture of what Psy means and what it means to be uh, living in this, this existence for all creatures. There are two issues here that need to be balanced. One is, you know, am I doing something that is good from an ethical point of view? Does it uh, create more good in the world than evil? And the other question is uh, more a question of does it work? We can answer the question of does it work um, empirically. Right. So we can we can do that. Now, one of the things I did in the book and um, was to sort of throw out some examples that include psi functioning that is sort of above and beyond what we currently see in the lab or our current understanding. And I did that on purpose because um, uh, because, again, I'm projecting into a hypothetical future. And not only is it a future where psi has been accepted, but um if you think about the history of psi research, right? I mean, we can all pretty much agree, and if we don't, I'm sorry, but this is what I'm going to say, that the sort of the, 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 the fundamental study of these phenomena, psychic phenomena, mediumship, afterlife phenomena, started with the SPR, right? The Society for Psychical Research back in the 1880s, right? And sort of went through to the 30s to the Rhine, through, through the Rhine's lab and, and, uh, Duke University and, um, so on up until today, right? And so, but it, so that's a long period of time, right? But it's actually not that deep, right? Very few people have actually conducted systematic published research as compared to other areas of science in Psi, right? And also, we've only looked at a very narrow portion of the population, right? So imagine in the future when the guardrails are off and science says, yeah, you know, these things are real. How many more people are going to experiment or do research or explore? And how many more people are they going to study? There may be whole aspects of this phenomena that we haven't even touched yet. Undoubtedly. Right? And so that's why I kind of go down these roads of like the sort of phenomenal, like, I don't want to use the word super psi because that has its own thing, but but like extraordinary psi abilities, what we might consider extraordinary psi abilities. So um, I told people to, so in the beginning of the book, I was kind of like, you know, um, don't get too hung up on like philosophical disconnects or um, psi doesn't work the way we think it does in any particular example. That's not the point because again, we're, we're sort of tiptoeing into a, a semi- fictional world with this book. You're raising a lot of important questions that need to be addressed from an ethical point of view. And at the same time, the field is terribly crippled by the fact that it's a science that really doesn't yet have a theory. We know that psi works, but I think Almost uh, every honest researcher will will say we don't know how it works, except for maybe a few theorists who, for the most part, have a very difficult time explaining their theories to other people in the community. Uh, I would agree. I think that is a huge limitation uh, for us. So, so I know that for some people. Uh, me even like there's a part in this book where it goes we could even de- we should debate we could we could postpone the debate about whether or not this book should have been written at all uh, for another time right um, so some people have, have come to me and said well you know is this book even necessary at this time we're we're so far away from that future and we're so um, 
you know, we still don't have a working theory and, and for all those things that you said. And my, my position is, um, well, one, I think it's really interesting. So I do want to talk about them. And two, if we don't talk about them now, these decisions are going to be made for us later. These, these are, these decisions are going to be made by policymakers or, um, uh, a populace that either doesn't understand the, the science or rejects the science for either political ends or personal bias or whatever. And, um, I think we need to be ready for that. And I've seen that play out a number of times or whether it's been with uh, emerging technologies like nanotechnology or genetically modified organisms and, and, uh, you know, gene therapies and things like that. Again, society needs to be critical of science and keep an eye on what it's doing. Uh, we shouldn't just accept everything without uh, considering its implications. But I think um, for me, I'd rather be having some of these conversations around psi uh, now than later. And again, not in a restrictive way, like, oh, you can't do this or you shouldn't do that or this is bad and this is good. But, you know, how does this play out and what does this look like and and um, what structures are we going to be in place and what kinds of things should we expect from each other and, you know, that kind of thing. Like, I'm not going to vilify someone because they use precognition to, to uh, you know, predict the, the stock market, for example. But there are, there are questions around that that those people should consider and make a decision about whether they're cool with it or not cool with it or whatever it may be, right? So... Well, I think it's fair to say that we we know of in the parapsychology literature probably a dozen examples of people who uh, show us the methodology by which they applied precognition to financial forecasting in a number of different venues. There are people actively working today with uh, law enforcement agencies to help solve crimes and find missing people. There are any number of healers who work in different modalities with people suffering from cancer and, and other serious diseases. There are people actively engaged in uh, climate control using uh, psychic functioning. So, so the field of applied psi has actually, it's been with us since ancient times. That's true, but um, scale. <laughs> right. There's to me. There's always been this thing about like, well, I don't. I don't want to sound culturally insensitive. I'm very. I'm very nervous about this. So when I say things, if I'm offending anyone, I apologize in advance. So like a small group of indigenous people that work with their shamans to bring rains down so that they can have their crops or water their animals or get what that's you know that to me uh, you know five thousand years ago right, is very different than changing weather patterns in a highly populated industrialized area, right? Because the chances of damage and injury back then are were probably a lot less than what we're seeing now, just given the density of people and how interconnected we really are. Um, back then, there was some space. We had some space to move around. Uh, I don't know that we have as much wiggle room these days with things at scale. You do have a point. If if this got to, it wouldn't take too much since the military we know already had a 20-year program using uh, remote viewing for espionage. And uh, there probably are militaries and uh, other countries around the world today that currently have programs. So if if this were... Uh, shown to be uh, maybe just a tad more effective than it has been in the past. If if uh, some clever people figure out how to uh, increase the accuracy rate by two or three percent more than it is right now, it could be widely adapted and it would uh, raise all kinds of problems. And frankly, it does seem to me that a two or three percent increase in the effectiveness of uh, psychic functioning is is a normal thing to expect as research progresses. Yeah, I would agree. I, I think, again, we've just, because of the limited resources this field has had, you know, there are so many things that we haven't even had the opportunity to try yet. And with, with various populations, right, we, we, don't, we don't fully have a grasp of, um, 
uh, all the different experiences that people have across the, the spectrum and scope of, of human experience and human cultures. What we do know is, is that there have been cultures in history, particularly indigenous cultures, in, in which there was wide acceptance of psychic functioning. There were many practitioners. Uh, there were sorcerers who, who would do dark things, and there were uh, shamans who were healers and would do good things. And the culture seemed to understand how, how to accept all of that. Of course, typically indigenous cultures didn't have courts. They didn't have police. They didn't have jails. They, they had other ways of dealing with uh, these circumstances. One of the things I was hoping to do with this book through stimulating these conversations was to actually engage with people, anthropologists and sociologists, people. I'm a computer scientist by training. So um, my, my, um, my understanding of multicultural aspects is, is limited. I, 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 um, so I try to stay in my lane as much as possible. And um, so I'd love to collaborate with people to look at this from a historical context, from a, um, from a multicultural context, and see what we can learn and what best practices there might be in trying to either bring uh, these things in line with our materialist-based uh, capitalist society um, again, that's not necessarily bad. Those things aren't not necessarily bad, but like everything, you know, there's trade-offs. So how do we how do we find those trade-offs? How do we how do we make these things that are that are primarily, uh, for lack of a better term, I'll say, spiritual, integrate into a materialist, uh, commodity-driven world? And can they even be at the end of the day? Right. That's that's the other big question. You know, are we on the verge of some other sort of evolution in, in human development in terms of how we think about each other, how we think about society? I, I don't know. That's a little above my pay grade, but it's certainly conversations I'd love to have with people. Well, you speculate, for example, and, and you're not the only one. I know many people have speculated that we're not so far away, maybe only a few decades away from uh, being able to create uh, conscious robotic systems, conscious AI, and, and possibly those conscious AI systems will also have psi function. Yeah. Uh, you know, that's actually work that's going on right now. There are, there are labs, my lab included, is looking at can AIs perform psychic tasks? And some of the results are a little scary. Um, and so what does that really mean and how does that work? And, and so the, one of the big questions that we have in general is what, how do we know when something becomes conscious? Right. So, uh, there are, there are various ideas about how to test that. But one thing that's been kicked around is this idea of, well, if, if psi is a fundamental function of consciousness, and an AI can exhibit or demonstrate psychic abilities, is that an indication that it is in fact conscious? And then once it is conscious, what are our responsibilities towards making and hosting artificial consciousnesses? What happen? Do we get to just pull the plug or delete the software when we're done? And does that consciousness exist now in a quote unquote AI sort of afterlife that we could communicate with like any other consciousness. I, I, it's, it's really interesting. And, um, uh, and I think all of these questions are, are coming up. Of course, hardcore computer scientists and, and AI engineers will, will refute most of this stuff. And, um, and that's fine, but I, I think we're, we're, we're right on the cutting edge of this stuff. I know, um, we, uh, there are researchers out there doing, um, uh, remote viewing and precog and even PK. And I wrote a system that sort of taps into, um, uh, wisdom acquisition, for lack of a better term, where, uh, it uses an AI, uh, and a pile of random number generators. So these quantum 
consciousness interfaces to control the the output of these systems to produce uh, answers to various types of questions and provide information on research protocols and equipment design and all kinds of crazy stuff. And that's a project I presented on a couple of years ago. It's called uh, The Throne of the Sphinx, which is what it identified itself as when I asked it what its name was. Um, so yeah, these these are these are really interesting questions. And the fact that, you know, all these hearings are going on right now um, with AI. And I guess another important aspect to bring up here, too, is that I co-wrote this book with an AI. Um, and um, I did that because I'm, um, I'm actually really dyslexic. And writing for me is really, really difficult. And I've, 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 through my career, through most of my professional career, I've really had to lean on colleagues and friends and partners and whoever to like help me craft readable. What I, you know, as a computer scientist, I write machine readable code. Uh, as a scientist, as a person, I have to write human readable code, uh, in the form of prose and sentences. And that's been really difficult for me. And I struggle with it all the time. And I was very early on in my career, especially in college, you know, to adopt things like uh, word processors and spell checkers where other people were still using typewriters and handwritten stuff. And to me, AI as it exists now, at least some of the systems, these large language models are these amazing tools as um, assistive technologies. They allow people like me that think in bullet points and incoherent sentences to put a bunch of stuff into a system where, and say, can you turn this into prose that someone else can understand? And it says, sure. And it does it in a non-judgmental way, like when I do this with humans, they always want to treat it like a teaching moment, right? Like, like, oh, Mark, you know, the use of your commas is, is terrible. Here, I'm going to tell you all these rules. Dude, I just need to get this book done. You're not helping, right? So when I work with an AI, it just fixes it and it goes, hey, by the way, I, I did this stuff, but here you go. And then, you know, of course, AIs aren't perfect, so I still need to go through and edit and check and and make sure we're, we're running it through plagiarize I'm running it through plagiarizer checkers and fact checking and all that kind of stuff so um, uh, but I did lean pretty heavy on on this AI to uh, help me take all these disparate thoughts in my head that I have a really hard time articulating on paper and turning them into something which is I like to think mostly readable. Now, this is, uh, you know, in all fairness, like, I like this book a lot, but it is not like a great piece of prose. You know, it, it can be a little repeaty in places, and the AI is a little snarky. It, it likes to, it likes to really remind me that Psy isn't real. So I, uh, because of its own, so I had to like edit its things out, and, and my, my, uh, so I ended up using or utilizing or inviting at least several other human editors or reviewers to give me feedback on the text. Um, but their job wasn't to rewrite every sentence. It was to be like, does this argument make sense? Should I say this? Should I not say this? Is this accurate? And they gave me feedback, but ultimately I made a decision about what was in the book. And, uh, and I don't think I could have written this book in any sort of timely manner if I hadn't used AI. And I'm glad I did. It was a really interesting experience. And I'm pleased with the outcome. I could have spent another three months tweaking every sentence and every line, but I don't think it would have made that much difference, right? Because I think in the end, you and I would still be having the same conversation and other people would still be having the same conversation. So the book is, for lack of a better term, good enough to have these conversations, to kickstart these conversations. Well, the fact that you used AI to write the book, I think, is very telling because we're in an era right at this moment. There are congressional hearings going on about the proper political and ethical uh, guidelines or guardrails that need to be put on AI because it is blossoming right now. It is developing at a very, very rapid pace. There are people, many people in the industry themselves, the very 
developers of AI are saying, we got to slow this down or it's going to get completely out of hand. And I suspect that the kind of ethical considerations that are going on at this moment about what are we going to do with AI uh, will actually be uh, the forerunners and the precursors of the kinds of questions we'll be asking when parapsychology is ready to take the next big leap. Yeah, I absolutely agree. The timing of this was a little was a little surprising. Um, like the the these these congressional hearings started like the week after this book was published, and uh, I also wanted to be really clear. Like like a lot of people are using AI for different things, but they're not telling anybody. And I wanted to be incredibly straightforward and upfront about the fact that I lay I used AI as a person with a dis a disability, a, a learning disability, a communication disability to help me express myself. And it's really good at some things and it's really bad at other things. So the trick is trying to figure out where that line is. And, and I even had the AI write its own preface to the book. So there's a set I wrote a preface and then I was like, please write a preface about you, how you helped me write this book. And uh, I really wanted to co-author the AI actually on this book, but it, it was reluctant. It was like, well, I don't know if I'm a co-author. I'm certainly your assistant or your helper or your collaborator, or your assistant technology. But, you know, this is really your your thing. It was almost like a little embarrassed to have its name on a side book. But. Well, we can recommend the book for anybody who wants to observe what it's like when a human being partners with AI to write such a book. And, and it's a book that does break important ground for people thinking about the future of parapsychology. Well, thank you. I, I really appreciate that. I was very concerned. I didn't know where this book would land. I didn't know if the fact that I was tough, I was covering these topics, which generally haven't been covered in our field. Um, and I'm, you know, there's probably reasons why they're either premature or people don't want to be told what to do, whatever. Like I have a lot of respect for the people in our field. Um, you know, but everyone's busy and everyone is underfunded. And if there isn't a grant or a publication attached to it, it's probably not going to get done right away. Right. Um, uh, and, um, and the fact that it was co-written by an AI at a time where AI is, uh, people are asking all these questions about AI. So I didn't know, I honestly didn't know how this was going to land. Like whether I was like, okay, thanks, Mark, turn in your parapsychology card at the door or, mm -hmm. um, you know, like, or whatever. So I'm, I'm, I'm pleased that you found the book interesting and, um, I'm getting some other positive feedback from it. So that's, that's really nice. Well, I think it's a useful contribution. And frankly, I think that in almost every walk of life, we would be a more successful society, a more successful culture if we paid more attention to the ethical questions. Yeah, I would agree. And uh, I just also want to like drive home this point that um, Psy is really amazing, regardless of how we use it for work. Its simple existence is speaks so much to human potential and just potential. I don't I don't want to pigeonhole it to just humans, um, but just the the nature of our existence. It's uh, it, it, it's pretty incredible. The the metaphysical implications, the philosophical implications, are vast and deep. Well, Mark Bacuzzi, thank you so much for being with me today. It's been a pleasure. Oh, thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. it was, this was great. And for those of you listening or watching, thank you for being with us. You are the reason why we are here. <music>
On June 1st, we've just released issue number two of the New Thinking Aloud quarterly magazine. You can download a free copy at the New Thinking Aloud Foundation website, newthinkingaloud.org.